Hi, Steve. Hi, how are you, Simon? I'm good, I'm good. Good. Yeah, I missed you the other Tuesday. Yes, yes, where were you? Where were you? Uh, I, I'd gone for burial, lost our lovely sister. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. I'm, I... Yeah. I'm so condolences, I'm so sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. So coming back from the other side, I reached home late. So right, yes, of course. Mm. Well, and it's exhausting as well, I'm sure. Yeah. <clears throat> How is that side? Oh well, yeah, it's okay. Um, it's a nice time of year, so the the weather's nice and. Everything starts growing after the winter, so suddenly it's it's a big change. So we like that. Yeah. But really, okay. United Kingdom is not doing well. It's really struggling. Uh, country has really gone down in recently. Yeah. And it's it's um it's quite distressing to be honest, but just because a lot of people are suffering, and you know it, we're not we're not used to it here. <laughs> Um, mm. and it, it's mainly well, it's energy prices have uh, have gone very very high, and uh, that really affects people here because of you yeah. know, heating and what have you. We're paying mm. the highest energy prices in Europe. I mean, by a long way as well. Oh. You know, that is so amazing. Is, yeah, it is really crazy. Mm. Uh, for us here in Uganda, we have got some heavy rains that has caused people even with floods. How, how is it there in uh, in Teso? Yeah, here yeah, in Teso, it's somehow okay, but uh, it has affected most of the people. Yeah. Yeah. It has damaged. It has damaged the crops. It has uh, fallen some houses. Ah, that is the situation here in Teso. So what I've been saying to people, I mean, it's very harsh and uh, 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 not to be unsympathetic. Um, we have to learn from this. We, what we see happening now, um, we have to let that now educate us because it's going to happen again. We're going to get extreme or extreme weather. And, um, you know, uh, and so we have to build more resilient systems. And, and, yeah. and, and we, you know, we're getting a push from reality all the time now. Um, in, in what's happening in Europe right now is the southern part of Europe, even though the summer hasn't started, they're already in drought. There's some major oh. rivers that are empty and big cities where the reservoirs are almost empty and people don't really know what to do. They're kind of behaving in the same way, but the water's yeah. running out. Mm. And it's really, it, it's really so, 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 so sad to hear such kind of news. Yeah. Well, affecting our people um you know and I, I i i can feel i mean we're all feel frustration um i've been trying to warn people about this for 25 years as it's slowly unfolding and people have not been listening you know um so here we are you know as uh, 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 we have to um use our abilities now to, to, to really find, you know, ways to go forward. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is like the way we are trying to preach, to preach the gospel of permaculture to people. Yes. In those areas which are most affected by floods. Yes. Uh, we, had, we had reached on to them and uh, we had wanted them to open up guilds such that it will help them in lowering that water. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and I brought to them here, to my home here, 
and uh, I showed them how guilds are supposed to be created and then how they are supposed to be opened and channeled to guide that water to yes. run through them. Uh, it would have prevented them from having such floods that are yes. attacked their that has fallen their houses. It is really sad, but uh, they, they have gone with the picture of how to open up them and uh, to put them into implementation other than just viewing and going away by the sea. I sent yeah. you some, some picture, I sent you some picture of, uh, of, of, of some system integration that I have here in my home. Yes. Uh, I, I, I don't know whether you received it. Well, how did you, where did you send it? I, I'd send it on the other email. On email? Yes. Okay. Well, let me, I won't check it now because when I check my messages, I'll probably, you know, have to check other messages. But, so, yeah, thank you. And, and I want us to, I, I, I want a lot more feedback from you guys, really, because I've done all. I've done a lot of talking now. I want to. We want to see your situations and help us understand that, so that we can, we could build designs uh, and strategies. So, yeah. Uh, apparently, apparently, chairman has delayed a bit. Uh, but he has called in for a meeting, uh, and how and how to begin to rearrange those feedbacks for you because it has quite been many of them that we have not forwarded to you uh, and it has given him also a lot of doubt that hey, what are we doing really uh, our mentor needs us to be sending these things uh, what are we doing but definitely i i and the teacher deborah uh, sometimes we also are taken up by some other activities whereby you know i understand uh, why are whereby we are not yet going in into that aspect of sending you those things. That's yeah, why sure. you see there is, that's why you see there is some kind of delay in sending those feedbacks. But otherwise, we are trying our level best to make people understand what permaculture is and other systems to be used in order to make the normal functioning of the, of the principles of permaculture yeah and it is it, and it is esco values so in 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 in, 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 in the meantime we we are apologizing and requesting an apology from you for that delay that has come in in in, in aspect of delivering the feedbacks to you mm, but otherwise let me wait for chairman to reach and then we shall come yeah to sure you again sure well, and, yes, you know, i understand you know we've all got many uh hello conflicting responsibilities yes oh god hello hello yes hello how are you guys um uh, yeah how are you I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to see you, Andre. So I'm just updating the YouTube link. Okay, there we go. I'm okay. I'm good, brother. Okay, hello. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Yeah. So that is that. That is the straight we have by principle. We are requesting that apology to be considered to you. No, I, 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 um, I, I understand. It's, it's okay. fine. Um, and we all just do the best we can in, in you know, in the time and resources that we have. Um, I understand that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I'm just waiting for a few others to arrive, but um, otherwise we'll start very soon. But <clears throat> uh, 
Mm. 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 So I, I I don't know whether it can be possible for you to at least give me light on what we went through last day. Uh, Brazo <coughs> Kelo, how are you? How is Uganda? Ah, uh, Uganda is cool. How is Congo? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I'm not in Congo, but I'm in Kenya. Kakuma refugee camp. <laughs> Hello. Yes, I said that I'm. Um, I'm from Congo, but I'm living in Kenya, Kakuma refugee camp. Oh, that's where you are? Yes. We understand, we understand when somebody is in that kind of a situation, it's not so good. Yes, that's why we are here to, 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 mm -hmm. to create something. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know, I don't know how far as our principle gone because he talked of bringing the system where we can deliver messages to each other to create a, a kind of a kind yeah. of unity for members of pharmaculture. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't know how far has he gone because some of the issues and the and the and the and the and the, uh, and the ideas are supposed to be crossed from country to country, from village to village, from. Uh, local such that we come to understand what each other we need, what that person is lacking, and how to make them also get up, run out of that yes. kind of a situation is hardening in life. Yes. I yes. Yeah. Yeah. I can say here in Kenya, mm. we are just mobilizing people to join our team so that we can start and teach them the principles, ethics, uh, designing. So we have, we have more, more things that we learned from our brother, Steve. So we are, we are just uh, mobilizing people to join our team. So once we get some pictures, some feedback, we will send it in group. We share it in the group and we will be having more 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 things to share with you with you yeah we, for me here i'm ready to join you people i will i will join you people to mentor in, in so many aspects i'm ready to join you uh, and uh, only communication matters a lot communication matters a lot that's why i brought again this issue of communication to our principal that let him create for us an account whereby yes. we are mm. Where, whereby we are in position to deliver our messages to each other, to mm. come to know yes. what we really need. So, so yes, that, that is a good idea. I, last time, last week, I, I suggest that we should have a WhatsApp group so that everything that you want to share, we can share it on, on WhatsApp. Yes. So it is, it is our principle to arrange it for us. He is the one to arrange it for us. And then communication will, will become simpler for all pharmaculture members in the whole world. I, I, know, I know he's listening to us. He, he, he's now the one to make us understand and know that this, that is our account of what mm. for communication. Uh, and message delivery. Okay, so if we, if we agree that we do a WhatsApp group, which we'll, we'll just use for discussing the themes of the course and sharing our particular situations, I think that's a good idea. Um, it just takes somebody to organize that, doesn't it? So, um, and, and if we agree that WhatsApp is the best application to use, um, because there's many different ones out there, but uh, what, WhatsApp is familiar. People were familiar with that. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. It is somehow cheaper for most people. You know, there are some systems that are a bit expensive for other countries. 
yeah. whereby they cannot be, whereby they cannot be in a position to afford. At least with WhatsApp, everybody can be in a position too. Okay. Mm. So we can work on that. It's okay. Yeah. Um, because so that. Yeah. Okay. Well, maybe Gerald can help me set that up. I, I'm not very used to WhatsApp, but I know it's it's not difficult. Yeah. Sure. And uh, hi, everyone. Sorry, I'm a bit hi. late. Mm. Yeah. You sure. Need a key. Uh, that's a good suggestion. We we will initiate that. I will take the lead on that. And uh, as Steve said, as long as you know everyone is committed to keeping the conversation uh, streamlined, yeah, and then also yeah. ensuring that everything shared on there is relevant to the purpose or to our PDC, then well and good. So I'll take the lead on that and I'll see how to, to get the individual's number gradually. Yes. Yeah. Mm. Because, yeah, that's, that's one thing I've been just struggling with or the challenge is to get a, a good dialogue, a two-way communication between everyone now. What I was saying is, you know, you've heard me doing a lot of talking <laughs> And I, I want to I want to hear back. It has to be much more two way now. And in, in our final weeks, what are we at? Nineteen now. I think we've got five more weeks. Um, so these these next four weeks are going to be very important. And we've got a lot to learn, as in how we apply these to our situations. You know, we're seeing <clears throat> we're seeing the devastation. So um, you asked what we talked about last week, Simon, and <clears throat> I was responding to the fact that many people ha had been affected by the heavy rains and flooding. And we started talking about building, designing and building more resilient systems and accepting, recognizing that we're going to be facing these challenges and, and we can't just behave like we did in the past. We've got to start to have a vision of how to go you know, into the future. And, um, yeah, so, you know, obviously landscape and water management is a big part of, of, of permaculture design. And really how we manage water is one of the very first things we think about because we need to catch and store. Um, what did, how did you summarize it, Gerald? You said slow spread and sink, I think, or something like that, which is that that's a really good th thing. We need to slow the flow of water, spread it sideways, and let it to sink in the ground. And, you know, if our swales aren't big enough, we have to make them bigger. You know, the, ob the observation is how big do I make my swale? Well, look at it when you've got a lot of rain and it'll tell you if, if you need to make it bigger. And these are the things that we, you know, they take time. Um, so the thing about permaculture is it's not an instant fix. Um, you've, you, you've got to apply yourself, you have to observe, and you have to keep tweaking and modifying, especially if the conditions are changing. And we have to build systems that don't get washed away. Of course, there'll be damage if there's a, you know, in some places, if there's a strong weather event, but we need most of it to survive so that we can then rebuild. We have to bring this into our design thinking now. And in and, and this week, I'm going to talk about agroforestry and food forests more because we need a lot more trees in our productive systems. For sure, that's part of how we achieve a much greater resilience. So that's a little bit of what we were talking about last week. And we went back and looked at the bioregional organization chart. Um, we touched on that, I think, in session 14. <clears throat> but I felt when we looked at that, I felt I learned a lot from that. And I think it gives us a sense of strategic planning and priorities. And, and again, that's what we're going to have to, um, you know, bring that into our thinking because of, of the challenges that we face. Right. So uh, we, we need to be strategic. So I'm thinking about Andre when you're saying you're slowly recruiting people to a group. That's fantastic. 
then you're going to think about how how are we going to arrange those people you know into teams um and, and to break down the many different tasks that we have to think about so that we can be focused and achieve things um you know on the ground so that we're ready for the next rainfall we're ready for the next growing season we're building our support systems and 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 learning and improving all the time because we whatever it is that we're doing we can always do it better we can always be stronger okay thank you caroline so yeah there we go so caroline's reporting how you know it, it, it that's exactly what happened to there that the swales weren't quite big enough and strong enough and they're going to have to repair but you're going to have to think about how to make them a little bit stronger and a little bit bigger. And <clears throat> we can use plants for that, remember. And the anchoring of roots um, makes, obviously, the soils uh, reduces soil erosion, but it also increases infiltration for, uh, for rainfall. So and we, we obviously, last week, we, we, remember, we, we saw some pictures of vetiver hedges that uh, 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 Teb and Deki Ali has been constructing there at, uh, at um, Butambala. And, um, you know, there's many techniques that we can use. So let's choose which one we're going to use and start to deploy them now so that we're ready for the next extreme weather event. We, 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 you know, um, we've got and, and, and then think about what we can build on top of that to make it even stronger, because that's where we're going to have to go and um and, and and you know we've got to lead the way for our communities as well we've got to show working models that people can learn from caroline would you like to tell us anything more about um about what you've been doing there in in in, in uh sorry i didn't catch the name of the place um if you're able to chat do just tell us a little bit more um otherwise we'll carry on but yes do <clears throat> yeah Yes, uh, um, I could uh, say a little bit more about that. Oh, yes, we have Caroline and Carol mm -hmm. the little that we planted there. We'll make it now well, very soon. Okay, mm -hmm. so yes, what you've just mentioned, I think to do with swells and then other resilience techniques is the way to go. Actually, when I was, I've, I've just had a, a meeting with the people from MMS in Tororo, and they said that swell alone was sort of another resilience enforcement. Uh, apparently, they've been uh, having lots of flooding from uphill, but then they realized that that alone, if if properly done over time and replicated over the landscape is going to be very vital, not, uh, not only for the flooding, but even for ground groundwater recharge. Because yes. as, as you, you slow, so it's basically slow, spread, and then sink. So all those are having multiple impact. As you're slowing it down, that means you're reducing the pressure, you're reducing the erosion. Spreading it means uh, taking it to have it evenly spread across the landscape. And then sinking it further is not only, is going to also play a role in doing both the groundwater recharge, but also uh sort of allowing you to harvest the water where it's most needed as we always say the best place to harvest your water is in the ground because at the end of the day it's going to form back into the cycle i will i will show that image later on but uh in the interest of time please i will say let's proceed okay and let's carol is she on YouTube or something? No, she's there. She's there, but she, she's, she, she may be not able to speak. She sent a message. Oh, she's there. I thought I'm, uh, I'm available. Yes, Carol. Oh, she. Uh, hello. Th okay. You sound like you're on a motorbike. 
Okay, she's gone again. Okay, so we've got a lot of disturbance there. No problem. Okay, um... She's traveling. Yeah, it sounded like a... Okay, hopefully you can see my screen, yeah. And um, here's, here's the page for today so far. Um, diversity is key, lesson 19. Uh, it, image, which is from our uh, teaching manual. Um, is showing a diverse food growing system. We're seeing canopy tree, an understory tree that's been coppiced, shrubs, ground cover plants. We've got a banana circle. We've got some water harvesting. We've got another kind of swale system looking like this. We've got climbers, a trellis, chickens. All of this is to give us the idea of a diverse system. And, and the theme for today is to use and value diversity. It's diversity that, that gives us the resilience and it also increases the yield. And I'm going to um, take you to a very particular place um, today. So it's, and this is called the Wakelands Agroforestry Research Farm. It's in Suffolk, which is in the very east of, of the United Kingdom in England. And I'm going to challenge you to use your imagination because I'm going to show you a temperate system, a cool temperate climate system of farming. So that's how we do it in the UK. You have to translate it into a tropical system. Remember, the patterns are the same, but the details will be different. So um, uh, that's very important. So if we're looking at the patterns in this picture, this is a tropical picture. So when I look at that, I can think, oh, well, I, I could substitute that tree with, with you know, a timber tree that I'm familiar with or a fuel tree that I'm familiar with here or instead of bananas, I might grow apples. Um, you have to supply the detail all the time. Permaculture is always showing you the patterns. On the PDC, we show you the patterns uh, more than we build down to the detail. So, uh, so I want you to hold that in mind, and uh, and 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 this will be our our lesson. Um, okay. So, why, why isn't that? Oops. Oh, I perhaps haven't. Oh, God. Okay, sorry. Ooh. Oh, sorry. I've got a different computer set up this week. I'm going to just... Here we go. Okay, so firstly, let's have a look at what it looks like. Um, oh, God. Okay, so this is the Wakeland Agroforestry Demonstration Farm um, in the county of Suffolk. And here is Professor Martin Wolf. This project, I think, was about 35 years of his life. So this is a, this, he's put, he put, uh, uh, Martin's passed away now, sadly. Um, he was still working at about 85 years old. And his, his wife, when I went for the tour there, she said, I told you to start it earlier. <laughs> um, but, 
in, in, in our climate, in the temperate climate here, things happen more slowly. So it, it takes many years for these things, systems to develop. And then it takes many years to really gain the, um, you know, to get the results. But what they have done at Wakelands and why this is so, so important is they've done the scientific research and they have the evidence of how effective agroforestry systems are and can be. And he's standing there talking to you, telling you about vast potentials that you can tap into by understanding the knowledge of what this man has acquired in his life. So I want you to be inspired by this gentleman because he, you know, at about the age of 50, he realized that to really test his ideas, he had to buy a farm and design it and run it according to a different set of principles. And here he is. Imagine the satisfaction that you must feel 35 years later and you're saying, I've proved the case for this approach to farming. So I'm going to try and explain. I didn't understand. This man had a lot of knowledge. He knew a lot about grasses, growing wheat and barley and things. Now, this translates to growing maize. Don't forget that the same types of plants. It's just that you're in, you know, so everything that you're going to see in this lecture is relevant to you also. You've just got to translate it slightly. So this man dedicated his 35 years of his life to developing this farm to show a more resilient form of farming. And it is based on diversity. So it's very relevant to be looking at this in the context of principle 10, David Hongren's principle 10, use and value diversity. So guess which bit is his farm and which bit isn't. You can see very clearly that the Wakelands farm looks very different from the land surrounding it. So this is in the east of England, as I said, we call this East Anglia. It's very flat there, as you can see. Um, and it's where a lot, most of the very intensive farming in the UK is done in this area. They have good silty soils and the flat land is very, lends itself for machinery, for industrial type farming with big machines. And one of the things that Professor Wolf noticed that over time is that those farms that are using those big machines and using chemicals is you know, even they have these fantastic soils, they're breaking down and they're blowing away in the wind in the summer and the land is drying out. So the UK is that we have a, 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 a cool, damp climate, but it's changing. It, it's changing because of climate change, but it's also changing because this kind of farming dries out the land. Now just look, at all that bare soil. This is what happens when you do monoculture because you're doing everything at the same time. Um, so let's firstly, before we go to Wakelands, let's contrast it. Let's look at the bit that's not Wakelands. Let, let's see, let's look at this, this bare soil and you can see the tracks of the tractors on it. Think about the compaction. Think about when the when the wind blows across this landscape, all that moisture that's lost, all that evaporation from that soil. Think now again about the sun shining down on that soil and the heat from that sun is going to make the carbon in the soil, the humus, organic matter, that essential component for fertility, for the soil microbes, that is going to oxidize and it's gonna go off as carbon dioxide. So not only is this not very resilient and eroding, but it's actually contributing to climate change at the same time. Now, nature, let me remind you, and let's just really remind ourselves and fix this thought in our minds. 
is nature never does a monoculture, a monocrop, one species of plant for acres of land. It never happens. So when you do that, you create a big field of maize or a big field of, of any kind of crop, it's, it's very vulnerable because you're, when you harvest, your soil is all bare at the same time. You know, if, if one pest comes along, it can multiply because you've prov prov created the ideal conditions for that pest to multiply. Um, you, you, you're literally setting yourself up to fail. Now, with these big monoculture systems, they use a lot of chemicals to control all the factors. Instead of working with nature, what they're trying to do is they're using energy and it's petrochemical energy to control nature. You can see, if you look at all of these farms, you see the, the impact of vehicles, of tractors, mechanization. We see huge areas of one thing and, uh, 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 and so much bare soil. So all of your alarm bells should be going when you see something like this. This is not sustainable. And again, let's just look at, the, at, at this, at these bare fields and say to ourselves, where are the birds going to nest? Where are the, the, the other species going to live? Where are the frog ponds? Where are the insects supposed to breed? Where are the, the, the predator species that might regulate potential pests? Where are they going to? to live where are they going to breed there's no space for them all we thought about is whatever the crop is wheat probably wheat 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 and i see it in africa maize 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 it, you're always going to create massive challenges for yourself when you do a monoculture system so okay that's what that's just looking out now let's just look in. Let's look at this area. This is the Wakelands Agroforestry Research Farm. It's surrounded by trees on every boundary, every perimeter. Why might they do that? Ask yourself, why did they do that? Are these trees productive? Are they part of the crop? Are they going to cut them down? Or are they just there for another purpose? I want you to use your powers of observation to look into this picture and ask yourself, what am I seeing? What is here? Let's look at this field here on the right hand side. I can see strips of what look like trees and they're in straight lines. And in between, we've got very narrow long fields well now let's think about why that might be the case this remember this is very deliberate that professor wolf spent 35 years developing this so he put a lot of thought into it so let's let's really honor and respect his work by looking at this image and asking ourselves why are they like this why are they that way and not that way? Because there's a reason. Why are the fields so narrow? There's a reason. This is not an accident. Nothing here is an accident. Let's get this next field. We've got very different kinds of trees here. Um, they're definitely different from here. I, 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 we can't see exactly what they are. But let's ask ourselves the questions. Look, and again, it seems like we have cultivation in rows between, the, between these trees. But look, we see where we do see some bare soil, see how it's protected by the trees. See how there is some shadow, some shade, how those trees might also be circulating nutrients, circulating humidity and protecting those uh, soils. Okay, let's just take a pause and let's, uh, uh, let me ask you a question. Look at this landscape. Imagine now if we have a torrential rainfall. Imagine now that we have 
you know, a, 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 a weather event. Instead of normal rainfall, we get supercharged climate change rain. What's that going to do to this soil, to this landscape? Think how much more protected the fields are within within the Wakelands Agroforestry Research Farm. Look how each field is contained by living plants. That's going to massively re reduce the erosion risk. And also look that, yes, he's done some ploughing and yes, they've got some bare soil, but only in small areas, not, whoops, sorry, sorry. Not the whole farm all at the same time. They're taking such a risk, this, the, 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 this surrounding farm, because they've exposed all their soils at the same time. So if they have a weather event, just on one day, their whole farm could be destroyed for a generation. Um, so this is a very high risk strategy. Now I'm gonna ask you a question as well to think about this is, okay this farm looks looks fine it's got interesting things going on but surely these intensive farm outside the next door neighbors ultimately they're going to produce more crop so let's ask ourselves the question is because professor wolf has done the the research and he's published it and he said he's made a contrast between the productivity of this field and of this field or this field. So that's so, so interesting. What is the impact of having all of these trees? The main reason we're doing farming is to produce a yield, to, to sell, to take to market. And so, okay, maybe Professor Wolf, he has more habitat for birds, for insects, for frogs and, you know, whatever. Uh, 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 important life there might be, but I'm a farmer. I'm here to produce wheat and barley or maize. Uh, I'm not so interested in these other things. Now remember the theme for this week, it's use and value diversity. So Professor Wolf has taken that and he's applied that idea of diversity to his land. So think again, let's also think about, look, this looks like we've got some pasture here. Uh, so maybe he's got some grazing animals and he's got that nicely protected as well. So that's one kind of system. We're seeing another kind of system here, something slightly different here. If we look over here, I don't know what there is here, but these trees are much bigger, aren't they? Look how these are much, much taller, more established. This is almost like a woodland on this side. So we've, he's really created a whole range of different conditions. So that's going to favor different kinds of birds, different kinds of insects. It's going to create different kinds of soil conditions. So we can explore that diversity and from it create a diversity of yields. Again, let's look at this section. This looks like just a woodland, very dense. And we've got some trees haven't quite got their leaves yet. Um, this must have been uh, early in the year. And, and, and some are coming into leaf. So again, another kind of diversity. You can see that he's not using one type of tree. We've got many types of tree. And um, now this is an agroforestry system. And, and, and what we mean by agroforestry is we're still doing agriculture. We're still growing things like wheat and barley and maize and potatoes, the kind of crops that we associate with farming. But we've also got forest systems. And so we can explore and think about what the yields might be from those systems and how that might contribute to the overall farm system. So, OK, we've got some settlement here. There's obviously a house and some barns and some farm structures. And I can tell you that one of the because this is an agroforestry research farm obviously there is research going on there so this farm has a relationship to universities to people uh, students doing long-term studies 
PhDs or I don't know, all sorts of different uh, 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 things. And I was one of the many people who was invited to come and, you know, to visit the farm and, and to learn and study from there. So I also realize that's obviously a very important part of the yield. So in what you're developing where you are, part of your diversity of yields is the knowledge that you're learning and then your ability to share that and to teach other people. So there we go. There's, there's our first overview of the farm. And, and, and as I say, just really take it in, see what we've got there and understand just how special and unique it is. And even without knowing any of the reasons, we can see that, that there is strategic placement of elements in patterns to fulfill functions. So this fits within of the way that we think and plan in permaculture. He's trying to copy and emulate nature, but also to do it in a way that suits um, you know, other functions such as maybe using farm machinery or you know whatever other reasons that there might be. So there we go, there's our first overlook of it. Let's jump inside, there's the professor. And he's standing there in a field of wheat. And what he's saying there, I'm gonna show, we're gonna to go to one of his lectures later on in this session. So we're gonna find out more about what he's talking about. And I'm gonna say, I don't, yeah, you know, some of this went over my head slightly because I'm not, I don't have the specialism that he has, but it's just, was, he's clearly, there's deep thought, a deep um, consideration gone into this. So here's us, uh, some of our group touring around. And now we are, we are inside the farm. Let's just get a feel for how different this is from a lot of what we're used to seeing. Now this just looks like a pasture field. Maybe it's cut for hay, uh, fodder for animals, especially here, well, yeah, in um, the tradition of farming in United Kingdom is when we're doing animal farming, is in the summer, we'll harvest some of the grasses and dry them and ferment them to, to, so that the animals have feed in the winter uh, when, nothing, when nothing grows, it's too cold. Uh, so we call that hay and silage and, and, and they're different techniques for storing grasses. And one of the design considerations that I was, we were told when we uh, came to this place was, um, the width of the field relates to the width of the mower on the tractor that they use to cut it. So let's say it's if it's five meters wide that the mower of the tractor, they've made the field, let's say 20 meters wide. So four passes and they've mowed it. So they've designed around the tools that they plan to use. There's a design consideration. They thought about how they're going to manage it and, 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 and they've, again, just think, this is a 35 year project. So this guy has, there's a lot of thought gone into this and, and, and you can build systems that look like this much quicker because you're in the tropics. Um, and I, we don't know exactly what the species of tree are here. I could guess a few of them, but, um, Clearly, they will have been selected carefully. But then let's just think about, so here's our pasture, and we can, and what we're seeing with little white flowers is clover. And clover is a fodder plant, animals like to eat it, but it also fixes nitrogen. So he's got part of the long-term fertility storage is by having nitrogen fixing plants, mixed in the lay in the mixture of plants that we're growing for, for, for fodder for animals. Um, think about how much habitat there is in these trees. Birds, insects and beetles and, and you know, worms and everything else. And then think about how those creatures in this hedge, in this hedge or in this, in the, in the forest strip, are going to then also interact with all the plants in this meadow. 
you can have bees and, and so forth. Now, all of that contributes to the long-term fertility, long-term fertile cycles. And also, let's just think about um, if we were to have extreme weather event, that this is much more protected. And that's very much in the design thinking behind this as well. So I could say another thing is if we just go back to our shot is you'll notice that all the corridors of trees are in the same orientation. And I can say, I can tell you that they are from north to south. Why? Why would they be from north to south? Well, the clue is the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. Um, in the tropics, the sun goes overhead much more. But for in, in our climate, the sun's lower on the horizon. So those trees would create a, 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 a huge shadow. If they ran east-west, there'd be a lot of shading. And we would, you know, we don't get enough sun. So we've got to design our farms to catch as much sun as possible. You might be designing your farm to create more shading. That's the difference. That's the detail. So the pattern here is we've arranged the trees in a way that either maximizes solar gain or minimizes solar gain. We're in a, the cool, temperate climate, so we want to maximize solar gain. So we put our, or our avenues of trees north-south, so that's the minimum amount of shading, of shadow on the, on the annual crops. So again, design, design to fulfill a function with a long-term goal in mind. Because that's the thing, when you design in this way, it may take a little while for the system to establish. But once it's in place, it's now permanently in place. Okay, so. So here's our first one of our types of field. It's a pasture field. It looks like it's just on the edge of a forest. And that's another principle in permaculture we're very interested in is maximizing edges because we create unique sets of conditions along edges. Because look, along here, we've got sort of the benefits of the grassland and of the forest. And it's going to be certain creatures and animals and insects that love to just hang out on this edge because they can sort of get the best of both worlds. So this is adding a layer of, of productivity because we're creating microclimates, microhabitats. So yes, we've given up some of the space of our farm. Um, we've given up some of the space to, that could be crops to trees. But we're going to get benefits from those trees that help the crops too. So there's an exchange. So again, let's go back to that question. Keep that in mind that I asked you is, how much wheat per acre do we get off this field compared to this field? Wouldn't that be interesting to know the difference, the comparison? So does this indeed have a positive impact? And if it does, by how much? That's the question that, Professor Wolf asked himself, and he wanted to prove. And obviously these farmers here are thinking, I'm not interested in trees, I just want my maize, my wheat, my barley. And who's gonna win? So let's carry on around the farm. We've seen here, this is a growing of grass, this is a fodder grass to feed animals. This is I'm going to say it's wheat. It might be barley. It looks like barley. Um, anyway, wheat or barley, it doesn't matter. It's a grass. We grow it for the grain. And this is the backbone of agriculture in Europe and 
is and uh, well across a, a, a you know, very very important crop around the world really is growing wheat and barley and wheat obviously we make our bread from barley we make beer from and also feed to animals but um really it's um this is a very very important food crop for us and it's it's not so different from maize really it's the same type of family but you'll notice let's notice some things in here so we've got the same kind of field. We can see uh, uh, some kind of tractor has driven through and we can see that the, tr the width of the, the field fits the width of the tractor. So we can see that and we can see the rows of the crops. But look, there are canes here, markers and there's little white cards. So something's going on here more than just growing the crop. They're doing an experiment. They're monitoring what's going on. Remember, that's another yield, is the learning, the knowledge. And because things are changing, because of the climate change, because of things, so we're going to have to monitor, observe and interact. Let's try different approaches and techniques and see what we learn, okay? We're using and valuing diversity and we're creating different conditions and we're going to explore which ones of those work the best. All of this is super interesting. Um, and I hope I can bring this all to life for you. Um, so again, we're just seeing what's there on the farm. We're walking around, you know, smell the air, hear the bird song, notice the insects, look at the soil, look at the ground, Look at the plants. Are they all the same? Look, what I'm seeing is they're certainly not all the same height, are they? <clears throat> we've got short ones, we've got taller ones. We've got some flowers and things in there. Uh, <clears throat> there's, I'm, you know, we're certainly seeing some degrees of variation. And then we're also seeing, again, alleys of, again, different kinds of trees again. I wonder how he selected those trees, what choices he made, what research he did to choose what varieties to, to, to do. I'm gonna ask you the same questions. If you're going to be inspired by the ideas, what trees might you want to use? Where would you go to source the, the, the seeds or the saplings to start your own uh, uh, experiments and projects? These are all things that Professor Wolf was thinking about. So, and, and, and these, the, we, we've got to learn lessons from him. He's not here anymore. He's passed away. So let's look at his legacy. Let's learn from that and be inspired. Oh, gosh. Sorry. Um, just take a pause. I'm going to pause for a second. Um... Gerald, just over to you for a moment. Just do, uh, give us a few summary thoughts. I've just got to sort out something here. I've run out of disk space on my computer, so I'm going to delete some files. Okay, Steve. Uh, thank you. Um. Hmm. Yeah, that, that was a really brilliant case study I, I was closely following. And then uh, also looking at the mouth functionality, but also as part of the, how it relates to our theme for today. Yeah. Valuing and utilizing diversity but then, uh, as we already say, these these principles don't uh, exist in isolation. At the end of the day, we see ourselves again drawing back to, or even uh, move fast forwarding forward to valuing and utilizing uh, the marginal, actually. So it is really brilliant. I think we have Caroline putting up her hand. Yes, Caroline. Okay. Um, we had something very interesting. We tried to do that. 
um, at the demo farm, we planted uh, vetiver along the edges, right very close to the edges because uh, of the flooding. And then we planted some kind of uh, bean that uh, acts as a vegetable. It is a climber. It lasts for about two years. And uh, again, you know, we also put in some other beans which grows as a shrub along the fence together with the climber. So this one is going to act uh, as a barrier so people cannot, uh, you know, stay in. And uh, at the same time, we can get the beans from there. So this is interesting. I don't know how to share pictures. Maybe when we have the WhatsApp group, I'll be able to put the pictures there. So it will be interesting to see how all this, you know, <laughs> comes up to uh, when, uh, how all this develops. I think it will be nice to see how our edges, our margins will be at the demo farm. Yes, uh, and uh, yes, Caroline, thanks so much for that. And remember, with permaculture, we are always inviting the problem into a solution. So imagine uh, like Professor Martinez farm is uh, sort of the oasis in the middle of this vast desert of monocultures and all those. Imagine if your farm or your site is going to be that oasis. That means all the essential elements, all the useful elements, the bees, the beetles, and everything are going to end up in your space. Yeah? yeah Imagine. Right. Okay, the space is not big, but we even have a small wood lot. We have a small wood lot at the corner. And uh, last time I came from Uganda, I carried some bullet seedlings. You know, we, I want to do the indigenous food. And uh, we also have a food forest. Um, I think in, in a year or two, yeah, it's going to be an oasis in the middle of <laughs> all the monoculture that is happening there. Yes, and and regarding indigenous trees, actually, uh, there is uh, a booklet that we have uh, by a Kenyan lady. Is she Na Natima? Yeah, uh, Najma Durrani, yes. Yes, she has a very good collection of those. So depending, and uh, is from experience and research. So meaning she has done a proper you know, experience proper research about it. Lots of indigenous trees that we can utilize for our agroforest, and they are really, really much purpose. For those uh, in Uganda, there is what we call um, a mutuba tree. Mutuba is uh, ficus, uh, ficus, but then uh, it was the one used for back cloth, essentially. It's very friendly, very relative, and then uh, also when it comes to agroforestry, it's one of those that are highly recommended because it's neutral, not acidic, so the flowers, the leaves, and all that quickly integrate into your soil system, so you have sort of a self-composting setup. Oh, yes, we will share the contact or, or even the title of the book. Um, we have uh, Simon raising up his hand. Uh, Steve, when you're ready, you let, let you let me know. So I switch back to you. Maybe okay, let's, have, let's, ha uh, let's have Simon's question and then I'll go back. Oh. Simon. Thank you, Gerald, by the way. Thank you. 
Uh, yes. Thank you for everyone there. Uh, now, when we are in the agroforestry, agroforestry really it is good for us to practice it because it binds up the, the, the soil particles together and by so doing that, it reduces the agents and the components of soil erosion from washing up our topsoil, which is so fertile, which is so vital for, for us. So uh, when one goes in for that practice of agroforestry, there is a way it helps us a lot. Mm, climatically, it, 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 it is also so good. Uh, and then when there is dry time, more so when you go to those trees that 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 fall off their leaves those leaves would be shaded off onto the ground where they act as mulches those, those leaves would act as mulches which mulches are good for maintaining the water content in the soil at that time uh, and the, and the, and the, uh, it will it will be decomposed by the organic matters, by, by, by the micro living organisms that are already in the soil. And it adds, it adds humus into the soil. And into adding it into the soil, it, 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 it brings up the fertility level of that place. And it renews the cycle of that soil maintaining it, it is portability, maintaining the moisture content, the water retention capacity of the soil, uh, aeration, uh, erosion. So really it is good to practice agroforestry such that it reduces the risks of drought, it reduces that, that act of soil erosion look at the way for applying erosion erosion every corner erosion simply because of the agronomic practices that we have really failed to practice them well that is why it is good to incorporate all the systems of uh, the systems and the value and the, uh, of, of permaculture into our fingertips so that we reduce that aspect of erosion. Look at the way people of Mbale, Mbale, even here in Teso, uh, floods have attacked them. That's why it is necessary for us to, to, to practice agroforestry. Uh, and those who are in the slopey areas, really there could be a need for them to carry out what we call it, afforestation. They should carry out um, Mm, terracing uh, and then the construction of the gabions the gabions and those guilds at least it will help us capture that speed of running water uh, and then it will be gathered in a place that we have designed to store them to reduce their speed of runoff to reduce that damage that they will cause to us. Uh, 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 and when you are to bring agroforestry, look at the type of a, a, look at the type of a tree you are to plant. After planting it, what is the next crop that you are supposed to bring in such that it will help the system to be uniform? Mm, uh, like him, for us, like 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 for me, uh, in in a in a place where erosion used to happen to me, uh, I put three four oranges around that position. But since from that time, I have not seen again erosion passing through that place because of the binding effect of the roots of the of the what of, of, of the of the tree. So it has helped me a lot to combine and to buffer 
the, the, the soil particles together and reducing the rate at which erosion used to occur onto my land. That's why I really provoke that uh, the basics of agroforestry are good, not only to the soil as well as to our health, because there are some of those trees that are medicinal to us. They help us in treating some of those stubborn diseases that disturb us a lot. That is what I wanted to add on what our principle, as I said, on agroforestry. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution, Simon. Very valuable. Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we're back and uh, we were doing our tour of Wakelands and we're using our powers of observation to understand what we're seeing and we're relating it to our permaculture ideas. Now, interestingly, Professor Wolf isn't a, a student of permaculture, but he's a student of agroecology and, and, and he's followed his line of thoughts, but it's led him to the same conclusions that we are you know, exploring as well. So when I had the, the honor and the pleasure of visiting this farm, I really felt I learned a lot and I was very excited to see you know that he'd done formally done the research into areas which you know which the very same things that we are interested in in permaculture so it was a great coming together um so here it is again and see again the layering in the picture come on in. Come on. Um, that there's our crop. And again, notice the different heights of the stems of the wheat. It's not all the same. It's not uniform. You know, sometimes when you see a crop, hello, when you, uh, uh, in a field and every plant is the same size, same height. And you can only imagine that every plant has the same root patterns and the same root depth. So, um, my little friend here just come to say hello and and so whatever we're seeing it's much more diverse than what we might normally see and then also if we look behind the professor we can see there's one form of tree and then there's another type of tree and then there's another type of tree so there's another layering and another layering of diversity don't know exactly what it is but we can see the patterning and to take these ideas with you and also it, this is this is this is to me that's so interesting is we can do growing annual crops in alleys and we can even do a bit of plowing and, and and what have you because the system is stabilized by these perennial plants around it and um so you can see that again a lot of thought and design have gone into this and let's think about how we can decode these patterns and think about how we're going to use them in our own designs. Um, okay, so then again, we're seeing they're really quite narrow, these fields. I'm, 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 and, and think how protected that feels. Think about the wind sheltering effect. And, and again, I think about the, the presence of all those birds and insects the things that like the conditions of the trees and the things that like the conditions of the of the wheat field. Now, as we went around the farm, what became apparent is that different areas of the farm, they were doing slightly different types of experiments. And what they were starting to tell us was they'd bred their they weren't just using one kind of wheat, but they cross fertilize them to create a population. So there's a, a set of generic genetic variations within these plants. So let's say there's a, a set of genes that's been crossed all the plants. So now we've got a range of phenotypes. The plants present themselves slightly differently. 
And so some might favor different kinds of conditions. Some are a bit more resistant to one kind of challenge, some perhaps more resistant to another. So even within what looks slightly like a monoculture, it's not because we've actually got different varieties. We, we, we've crossbred the, our plants to get a range of different varieties. Now there's a problem in that the companies that make bread or the people you might be selling your crops to, they don't necessarily want this. But if we're small farmers that are producing stuff for our own use and to sell locally, then that's not a problem for us. So we'll get a bit further into this, but there's a lot of different research going on here at the same time. Here we've got an area where they're growing vegetables. So a different kind of, uh, of environment. The trees look very different. Um, we've got they we've got some big established trees, but there is more spaced out. Yes, we've got some bare soil again, but it's it's nicely protected. And we've got a diversity of different vegetable crops growing. I can't see exactly what that is. That looks like some onions there or again is how are you going to adapt these ideas? You're going to adapt these ideas to suit your conditions and your crops. But Professor Wolf is showing us a very, very interesting pattern that, that we can learn from. So again, back to the diversity. We saw he had pasture fields, he had wheat fields, he's got vegetable fields. So we, he, we, he's so different from all those farms surrounding that are all trying to do one thing. So again, he's moved away from monoculture. Look, and we can see some caravans in the distance here. Um, there's like temporary accommodation. Uh, you can live in them in, in, the, in the spring and summer uh, when it's not too cold. And maybe that gives extra accommodation, perhaps for farm workers or for volunteers, students, visitors. And so again, it's integrating functions into the farm. We've got a little bit of, 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 of places for people to stay. And that might add another layer of functionality to the farm. Now we've got potatoes. So another kind of crop we're going to manage it in a different way. So look at all this diversity in one farm from this to this to this to this. It's it's it, it's fantastic to see and 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 um especially contrasting to that desert that that you know, that, that we see around. So my glasses are broken, it's a bit comical. Um, so here we now we've got nice rows of potatoes. But again, it's look, oh, I don't know what this sign is telling us, but it's probably telling us the variety of potato. So there's again, another yield is he's still doing more experimentation. We've got some big poplars here at the back, different kind of tree, different shape, gives habitat for different kinds of species, more diversity. So we've got so many ways in which he's introduced diversity of conditions, different diversity of plants, and then the arrangement of the plants to create particular kinds of shapes and patterns, all of which support his overarching function. Okay, so here we are in the potato field, just seeing that from another angle and see how look, the types of trees, the spacing of the trees, it's really different. So we've, we, there isn't just one way to do this. There's, there's, there's many ways to do this, incorporating the trees into the crops. So, and obviously these alleys where the trees are, those are never going to be plowed. Um, and also what they've discovered is where they do do a little bit of plowing and turning of the soil is it does disturb the roots of the trees, but the root, the trees respond by just going a bit deeper, going deeper than the, the, the depth that where the soil is being actively cultivated. So we have the long term protection of those trees. And as Simon was saying, it really helps build a stronger soil, build the crumb structure of the soil and, and, and contribute to raising soil carbon. So I can also say that the, the um, part of the research here is they're measuring the soil carbon in the forestry bits 
and they're measuring the soil carbon in the agriculture bits and comparing it and saying, is it, is it rising or falling? Is it rising by how much and, and, you know, and making comparisons? So again, this is whole farm is, is it's a farm and they're growing food, but it's also an experiment. Hey, sorry. Uh, yeah, so again, look, that's a beautiful landscape to be in amongst, it's very attractive. And, uh, and, and here we now look, this part looks just wooded. These are wild grasses that we're seeing in the, in the, in the foreground or, or you know, a mixture of that and other plants. Uh, and these are just some, um, uh, some of the, when, these are my observations when I visited it. And there was some um, information sheet uh, on the wall in the classroom and I just photographed a few of them just to kind of again show how the farm is sharing the knowledge um, they're, they're measuring the, the, the clover so the cover crops and the impacts of that this one's about crop heights um, balancing productivity with environmental protection so see here climate change and mounting concerns about energy supply have placed new demands on agriculture. We need to develop new land use systems that can resolve the food versus fuel conflict, enhance biodiversity, sequester carbon, and are adaptable and robust to climate change. Agroforestry, integration of trees into farming systems has the potential to meet these multiple demands. And our agroforestry program is leading the way in investigating this low input, biodiverse approach to sustainable production. Okay, look, we can see that there's one of the machines they're using in cultivation, but you notice it's a smaller machine. It's not, not like these modern ones, these huge things. So it doesn't have such a big impact. Can step lightly on the land. This one's about integrating chickens into the system. It says, organic poultry production is good, but not perfect. Often it's over-reliant on imported feeds and not making use of the, of the range. To provide the highest welfare standards and the most natural conditions possible for raising chickens, we've designed and implemented a nova, novel silvo poultry system on sheep drove organic farm. The birds are part of the whole farm rotation, obtaining more of, their, more of their feed from the bugs and plants in the range and providing nutrients for the crops. So think about a, a forest system designed to create good habitat for chickens. And then think about how that could be integrated into your uh, silvo pasta, whatever your, your, your agroforestry systems. And this one says, the more widely and perfectly, so this is a quote from Charles Darwin from 1859, and he, he really noticed how important diversity was. So here's a nice little quote. The more widely and perfectly the animals and plants are diversified for different habitats of life, so will the greater number of individuals be capable of their supporting themselves. So the greater diversity actually gives us a, a greater um, ability to support those populations. And um, we're seeing different examples here. So using high genetic diversity can, can increase the, di the reliability and stability of crop performance. This approach is being trialed with winter wheat across a large range of environments in the UK. So that's encouraging to see that the ideas being uh, trial at Wakelands, so Wakelands is over here in the east, and look, there's different places all over the UK where they're beginning to now try these ideas out. So something very, very important is happening here, and um, there's our little tour. So there's our little chance to have a look into that. Uh, I'm going to um, I'm going to hand it to you, Gerald just to field a few questions and i'm going to suggest that just take a short short break and we'll reconvene at the top of the hour so in about and about nine or ten minutes but let's if, if, if there's anybody would like to contribute i'm very very keen to hear your thoughts and imagine that you've just 
I've just taken you there. We've walked around the farm. You've seen those things with your own eyes. Even if Professor Wolf was here, what questions would you want to ask? So you can think about this or, or, or come and uh, bring it back after the break. But um, yeah, there we go. I'm going to just hand to you, uh, Gerald, and um, I'll see you all in a few minutes. Okay, whoops, Gerald had just, uh, just dropped out for a second. So, and I see Deborah's arriving as well. So that's great. Um, Gerald, when you're ready, I was gonna say, we'll take a few questions. Um, well, January's there as well, hello, January. <laughs> was it something general? I got kicked out. Oh, no. No, that was, I think just you, I just noticed you weren't there. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry if, uh, I don't think I kicked you out by accident, but uh, <laughs> no, I was I just saying, you know, imagine everybody, you've just been on that tour. I've showed you those slides. You've seen the agroforestry system. Imagine that Pressel, Professor Wolf is there um, or, or, or anything, but any, any, first, any clarification? What, what did you? What, could you imagine yourself were there, and, and what? What did you? Or did you have any questions about what you were seeing? Should I go first? Yeah. My first question would be, how how is he surviving in the midst of all those chemicals? Because <laughs> the reality is, a lot is being brought down from the neighboring farms. Is was there any mechanisms of uh, probably trying to suck out that toxicity and the chemicals coming along because he's fully surrounded? That's a good question. And um, I'll just go back to. So I, 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 I remember from the visit that um, one of the things I think this perimeter hedge is so important because you're right, there's going to be a drift of, of, of chemicals and toxicity coming from this intensively cultivated land. So I think these, um, these hedges are very, very important for at least reducing that impact, that effect. And, and another thing that he said, so we talked about growing, you saw him growing potatoes there. Potatoes in our climate, uh, they're very productive crop, crop, but they're vulnerable to fungal attack. Um, certain funguses really like to attack potatoes and we call it potato blight, phytophthora. And one of the things he said is literally that the blight is spread by the wind. So when you have um, uh, lines of hedges like this of narrow fields like this that really provides a resistance and the diseases if they are present spread much more slowly so we've got the physical barrier of the different uh, tree systems and then um also with pests and other potential challenges we've also got a wide diversity of species living on the farm that are going to help maybe regulate and, and, and minimize that impact but yeah, it's a very good question, Gerald. And I think something that, you know, yeah, it's a real challenge, isn't it? As we're pushing up against organic systems and coming up against the intensive systems uh, and we're starting to suffer, uh, you know, negatively from that. So that it really is a challenge. And then, so that's something that the agroforestry system helps dampen that effect by having this degree of tree cover. Uh, 
And I realized too bad for him, he didn't have anything like a wetland or a stream nearby that he could maybe try to incorporate the filtration into because yeah. because maybe on the upper side or if he had sort of a stream, then he would intens intensively grow things like maybe the likes of vetiver and uh, papyrus to imitate the natural kind of filtration. Yeah, sure. So yeah, again, often fast growing biomass plants take up a lot of nutrients and can perhaps protect from leachate from, from surrounding fields. There's a problem again with GMOs when people start using genetically modified crops is then you get the pollen from those comes in and cross pollinates with your crops and that can be a problem and um, that's something again that uh, organic farmers need to team up and challenge the you know the the, the non-organic farmers are over that thank you for that and any other questions observations For you late arrivals, we were looking at the work of Professor Martin Wolf, who, who spent 35 years of his life developing this agroforestry farm to really contrast what he could do with, a, with his mixed silvo pasture agroforestry system compared to these monoculture farmers surrounding him on all sides. Gerald, I'm just going to take a, 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 a very, very short break. I'm going to come back in a, 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 at the top of the hour. If, uh, what is the time? Oh, I've only got a couple of minutes now. Um, yeah, Simon's got his hand up. Simon has his hand. I should leave him in your good and, hands for a moment. Yes, and uh, I think after Simon, we will also take a break. Okay, Simon. I'll call the Francis. Yeah. Yes, Francis. Uh, from, where? from Tapa. Okay. I yes. have a I have a question. How would one control the linking of nutrients? Okay, the linking of nutrients from your plot or from your area. One is uh, one of the things that Steve has been talking about is uh, either creating sort of natural barriers across or call them natural hedges, for instance, around, around your, your property or your site. We've uh, also had a look at the, in the tropics, things like vetiver, which are both mouth purpose, but then you can also creatively uh, plant them as your hedge for numerous functions. One of them is to control the, the you know, escape or leaking of uh, your nutrients, as well as uh, providing a natural swell towards uh, controlling erosion. So, because we know one of the ways in which your nutrients leave uh, your site is through through erosion or being transported by water. So as you maintain or become selfish with the water or making sure the water is contained within your site or your property, then you're also keeping the nutrients within. So as you do the water catchment, know that you're not only doing water catchment, but you're catching the nutrients too and you're slowing erosion as well as deeply, if you're to look at it in the long run, you're also recharging your groundwater system. Uh, Martin, does it answer your question? Do you have any other kind of questions or clarifications you need?
Hello. No, thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you oh. for that, Gerard. Okay. Uh, so as uh, uh, as the topic is utilize or maximize the value of diversity, and then also correct placement of your elements and ensuring there is a uh, multifunctionality all over. So it could be probably things like Coriandra, Leukina, uh, Vetiva, so that the more elements you have and once you have them correct, correctly placed, the better. So we're going to take a seven minutes break. And then we'll be back at uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes past Hello, the hour. Dear. Yes, please. Hello, dear. you try to remind me, Caroline, that Tapa is crying for the ceilings of Petiba. This is this this is the right time that we really need to at least mad. Okay, okay, and I think. She I think she has had it directly. <laughs> yes, I've had. Uh, uh, I've had. Um, uh, uh, maybe we see how we can go about it. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Let's take our break and then be back at uh, exactly 10 minutes past the hour. So that's seven minutes. All right, see you all in uh, seven minutes, which is now about six. I will be uh, as, okay, as part of your break, could you please put your numbers in the chat so that I can start creating the WhatsApp group?
Okay. <clears throat> okay, we've had a short break. I am prepared and ready for the next session. So um, I will, you can indicate to me when you're ready. Um, I shall chatter away in the meantime. Hey, hey Damani, <laughs> I have something to say for you. Oh yeah, thank you. Yeah, come on. <laughs> yes, please follow. How are you? We good? Yes, I'm Johnson Chamantapa. <laughs> Greetings I just to wanted you. to greet you. That last session we missed because our chairman, our member, Simon, had lost his sister. So we were together with him to pay tribute to that family. Yeah. Thank you. I understand, and I, I'm sorry for the loss, and and I, yeah, and thank you very much for, for, yes. for that uh, explanation. Mm -hmm. And uh, everyone is we do missing that station. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, a reminder that. So we one of the things we're also talking about is we're going to build a WhatsApp group now to allow ourselves to communicate more and to share your experiences and we want to see see more of we last week we talked about the floods and the flood damage from heavy rains we need to understand how we can build our landscapes to be more resilient in the future so when bad things happen we must observe and we must learn and mm -hmm. um and, and and use that learning to make our systems more resilient mm -hmm. um and of course, I understand that this is obviously it's distressing when these things happen, but we, we have to um, allow it to inform us. And uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And again, we do apologize for the delay of. Uh, uh feedbacks i think uh, we are going to make it and we are delivering it to you okay thank good. you thank you thank you no, thank you very much and obviously we we have to 
we can all learn by seeing how are we applying these ideas. I'm showing examples today from, it's a cool temperate, it's, this is the UK climate. But the, the patterns, what we're seeing here are ideas that you can adapt to suit the specifics of where you are. I know that the systems you create won't look like this, but they can be informed by the same ideas and the same understanding. And that's what we, you know, that's again one of our, our uh, uh, ways of thinking in permaculture. So now I'm going to, I attended a talk, this is uh, quite a few years ago now, um, eight years ago, uh, in East Anglia, and which is where I first met uh, uh, Professor uh, Martin Wolf. And, um, and this is the slideshow that he gave on that occasion. And I'm not going to claim that I understand every detail of what he's saying, but in looking at this, I want to learn myself and I want to try and share some of his depth of knowledge with you. So once again, we're seeing a, an aerial view of Wakeland's farm. I think this is a, an older picture because the trees are much smaller. But again, we can see it looks different. And um, all surrounding all around the outside, we're seeing intensive monoculture fields and inside we're seeing a whole variety of different approaches but all of those approaches are typified by having much more trees much more diversity edges complexity and, and, and so forth so this is the talk that professor wolf gave i can't recreate what he said but these are his slides and let's have a look at it and let's ask ourselves, well, what can we learn from this? And, and I'll try and bring that to life for you. So here we go. Um, so you notice that this is part of the Organic Research Center, uh, 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 Elm Farm, which is in Oxfordshire, whereas this, this farm is out there in Suffolk. And Professor Wolf starts off by saying, in a, when you have a monoculture, that's a big field with one crop, it's highly competitive with each of those, because each plant, each individual plant is identical. They occupy the same niche in the same space and same time. So they're all trying to do the same thing at the same time. That's what we're seeing here. This is highly competitive. We've got one species of grass um, with one shape of roots, with, with, with a set of nutrient demands that are all the same. So they're competing with each other. So it says, and to minimize that competition, we have to add high inputs of nutrients. We need pest, disease, and weed control and water to be able to do that kind of monoculture farming we're dependent on there being a stable environment that all of those resources are actually available to us uh, the pesticides the fertilizers and the energy is cheap because again in this monoculture system we're using big machines to work and plow the land, to distribute the fertilizers, to distribute the pesticides. These systems only work when we have a stable environment, lots of resources and cheap energy. All three of those things are now being compromised by the climate problem, by the energy crisis. So again, we have to move away from monoculture and you guys within permaculture, we're the pioneers we are pushing this forward into new areas. Now, there's lots of different problems that we can associate with monocultures. And we're creating a set of conditions that actually favors the pest. In this case, this is a, 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 a rust, that's a kind of a mold or a fungus. 
that likes to attack the wheat. So we've got hundreds and hundreds of acres of wheat plants and they're a bit stressed because they're competing with each other because the soil's been, uh, you know, run down because we're using chemicals. So these plants are super susceptible to these kinds of diseases. And I think this yellow stripe rust is one of the diseases that they've been tracking to compare the difference between the intensive farms and agroforestry farms. So we can, through observing and understanding the, 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 you know, the, sort of the, the, the problems, we can then use that as a measurement to see the relative health of the system. Right, so this, um, um, this rust is actually called, whatever it's called, Streeformis. That's in these highly competitive monoculture conditions, it's actually made the pest itself evolve. So he's saying monoculture encouraged a ma massive population increase in this pathogen. Uh, in this disease causing organism, not least that this organism evolved to be resistant to the varieties of fungicides that they were using to control it. So now this resistance to monoculture is becoming, so now globalization of resistant monoculture, yes, okay, so the more we do a monoculture, the more we've created super pests that evolve really quickly. It's a, it calls it a spore producing factory. And the response of farming is to be more aggressive. Um, and I oh know I say, sorry, no, no, no. Okay, yeah, so the, 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 the fungus, the fungus itself has become more aggressive and it has a wider climate tolerance, which means it can be successful in a wider range of environments. So this is, this is the academic research. So the more we stress the systems, we actually create the conditions to, for the pests to evolve and become more aggressive. And we know about, we keep talking about it, we know that the, the climate is becoming instability, our weather patterns are becoming unstable, and this is caused by climate change. There's a pressing need to simultaneously both adapt, that means change the systems to what we do to fit these ch change conditions, and to mitigate. That means stop polluting, stop making it worse. And he asked the question, how? Where is the model? Where can we go to learn? Well, that's what, that's the reason that Dr. Wolf created Wetlands and that's what we are all learning from today to go, well, we have to create the models. We have to create the ways forward so that people around us can see how we are adapting and mitigating to these changing conditions. So the best model, Charles Darwin spotted it back in 1859. It's the natural world with all of its diversity, its interactions and evolution of complexity. So the more diverse the, situ the, more diverse the elements in the system, the more complex the interactions are with between them and that makes in itself a more complex system it's then much more robust. It doesn't create the conditions for these super pests to get established and then cause enormous amounts of damage. So the unifying concepts in ecology um, are this, that there is a positive correlation. There are positive correlations between diversity and stability so the more different kinds of uh, species we have, the more stable the system. And between diversity and productivity, the more different species we have, the more productive the system is. And so recently proven for large scale natural and agricultural 
systems. So what Charles Darwin observed in 1859 is now being proved in 2010 through um, more research. We know that diversity gives us stability, diversity gives us productivity. We use and value diversity. This is our, our, our principle today. So there's a relationship between these things. <clears throat> so let's have a look at what these, this relationship is. So he's saying there's something about biodiversity. There's something about ecosystems functioning. Okay, that's, how, how, you know, how well that ecosystem is. Oh, yeah, I get this. And the abiotic environment. Um, so by that he means the non-living environment, the, the, the conditions created by life, things like temperature, rainfall, and soil fertility. So the species richness, the, the, most, the more diverse of species we have, the composition of those species, and, the, and, and those multiple interactions, supports and contributes to ecosystems functioning productivity, biomass, nutrient cycling, water retention. And, and, and the more, the better the ecosystem functioning is, the better that supports the biodiversity. So we've got a positive win-win correlation between those two things. But it goes further. The more we can increase biodiversity, species, species richness, interactions between those species that in itself contributes to better and more regular rainfall improved soil soil fertility temperature regulation shading and um, the abiotic environment it also benefits and that st stable temperatures better rainfall improved soil fertility also feeds back and contributes to the biodiversity and then see clearly in the same way there's a positive beneficial relationship between the ecosystem functioning and the temperature rainfall fertility etc so if we can get all three of these areas working for us contributing to our system the whole thing is going to function at a higher level and this is research that was published in 2010 and shared shared with us in about 2012 and 13 by professor wolf um, so, in when we went on our tour of the farm, I said to you, each one of those fields was also an experiment. And one of the things that Professor Wolf is interested in is contrasting his, what's going on in his field with the monoculture systems. So, this is key. One of the ways that Professor Wolf created diversity in his farm. He wanted a field of wheat, okay? Uh, and the same way as perhaps you might want a field of maize. But he didn't create a monoculture of one type of wheat. Instead, he identified 16 different species of wheat. And on one, on one test area, he grew them separately. And in another test area, he grew them mixed together in an intimate mixture. So, you know, when we observe those, the, the wheat in the fields, and I said, look, some of them are much taller than others, different shapes and structures. And that's because he mixed together 16 species. So what was the yield in tons per hectare from, from these two experiments? Well, if we grew those 16 species not mixed together, but in a monoculture of just one, 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 the average yield was 7.35 tons per hectare. However, once you visualize that, seven and a half bags uh, per, per unit, or however you want to see that. Where he mixed them together, they got 11 and a half tons per hectare, 11 and a half bags or bushels per area. 
So look, we've gone from 7.3 to 11.4. That's an increase of that's half as much again, just by mixing them together. So he says species redundancy enhances ecosystem resilience. And I think what that means is when you've got 16 species mixed together, some are going to really favor this year's conditions and some eh, might not do so well. A little bit whacked for me, a little bit damp for me, a little bit cool or a bit hot. But the, but the average is out because some will thrive and some might not thrive. So some of those 16 are a little bit redundant. They're spare. But what we're doing is we're guaranteeing that some of, you know, it's much more likely that some of those species are going to favour this year's conditions because you've mixed them all together. So look at the difference. This is, I think, very, very important research, very important numbers. Uh, the effects of deforestation on humans and on the planet. Well, it has negative climate change effects. You know, if we remove the trees, the soil gets hotter. We, you know, we talked about that earlier. Soils break down. Um, trees have a cooling effect. They have a shading effect. They, they, they rehumidify the atmosphere. So actually, when we take away the trees, rainfall goes down. Um, there's a danger of the, so of the uh, soils becoming saline or salty. They could break down into the desert. Um, we lose biodiversity both above ground and below ground. And obviously, the soil that's breaking down is, 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 is uh, susceptible to erosion. When we have soil erosion, that leads to strife, war, loss of civilizations. It's, it leads us to a terrible place. So again, think how important this knowledge is that we're, we're learning about integrating trees, having diverse populations of, of our crops surrounded by trees. So the value of trees to humans and the planet, look, we kind of know this, but let's spell it out, let's be clear. To humans, trees give us shade, shelter. They get heating, for, uh, we can burn wood for domestic, for smelting ores, cooking, um, building, I mean, whatever, houses, boats, utensils, tools, other artifacts. Trees give us fruit, they give us nuts, medicines, animal fodder, bedding. I mean, on we go, right? Use your imagination. Think of all those yields of trees. But, but, but for the wider planet, Professor Wolf is also saying, look, they, they, they influence the local climate. They give habitat for other plants and animal biodiversity. And don't just think about above ground, think about in the soil, below ground. Trees help with soil development. Trees help with the cycles of air and water. They contribute to filtration and cycling. Uh, trees help sequester carbon. They help translocate, move carbon from the atmosphere, through their leaves, through their roots, so their mycelial mycorrhizal connections, they're channeling carbon into the soil, which is going to have a long term positive effect. Trees are essential in nutrient cycling. So we're hearing this really spelling it out. We need to have our trees and we need to have diversity. OK, OK, diversification. Diversity is needed simultaneously I mean, at the same time within crops. So we need to mix together and have populations of different varieties, even when we're growing a, a single crop. We need to have diversification among crops. That means different crops. We need to bring in animals. Um, and we need to and, and have diversity of animals. And we need to bring them into rotations, species mi mixings, Mixtures and intercropping. And we need diversification among the main elements. So if we're doing an agroforestry system, we also want lots of different types of trees in different spatial patterns, 
and to create different ranges of conditions. So think about how we've got diversity upon diversity upon diversity. This is what we have to be going towards. This is the really deep lesson that is coming from Elm Farm Organic Research Center. 35 years of study, academic study, starting out to kind of give us the numbers, give us the knowledge that, that, that supports and reinforces what we felt we kind of knew already. And, and when I uh, went to Wakeland's farm, I, I, I thought this is I, so, because one of the criticisms that people sometimes level at permaculture is they say, we haven't done enough research. We haven't, you know, done this kind of academic work. Well, it takes a long time and it costs money. Um, so we're very fortunate to have people like Professor Wolf to go and learn from, okay? And, um, and so I'm also gonna challenge you that as in your own work is keep records, make observations, take photos, file those photos. Let's, let's again, keep thinking about um, uh, the value of the learning of, of, of what we're doing. And uh, as we begin to apply our permaculture, you know, uh, design ideas to our communities. Um, here's a comp wheat variety mixture stability. I couldn't quite work this one out. I couldn't quite remember what this was telling us. Um, but there, uh, ah, oh, I've got it. I can see it. Yes. Okay. Ah, okay. So this is a type of uh, wheat called shamrock. And this is its stability. I guess they're diff in different fields or different seasons. Let's imagine these are four different yields or I don't know, but whatever it is. So in this one, the total yield is 101 or the average yield is 101 over across these four seasons. That's with shamrock. We've got one called Malacca and they can see, look, one year it did quite well. Next year it did not so well. Next, good year, that one, and then another poor year. Its average was 95. Then we had Heriwood, another different wheat variety. So here we see it had a couple of good years, it had one really bad year, then it had a really good year. Its average was 104. In field four, we mixed Heriwood, Malacca and Shamrock together, and their average yield was almost the same each year. Um, look, the total and the 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 average for the all four across the four years was 110. So when we mix those three varieties together, we had a more stable and a slightly higher total yield. Think about what that means. Think about what that's telling you. That's incredibly important and insightful. We're seeing here all the evidence how why we need to move away from monocultures. We need to be open pollinating our own seeds. We need to be creating varieties that suit our local conditions. You know, um, the big global seed companies don't want us to do that. They want to be able to sell us single varieties that create monocultures. This is what we have to move away from. So we're going to be get more and more interested in those kinds of plants that we can work with a range of varieties. So just look at, understand what this means. A single cultivation compared to a, a population mixed together. And that was what we were seeing in those slides in the first half of the lecture. We were seeing the mixtures of the, of the wheats, different varieties together. And we can now begin to understand why that might be the case, because there's less competition between the plants. The shamrock, the malacca and the heriwood have slightly different root shapes and maybe they grow in slightly different time frames. So there's less competition and there's more mutual support. This is very, very important data. Okay, another one, 
a little bit hard to understand. I'll just give it a moment. But this is uh, a field try of spring barley. Um, so it's another grass crop like wheat. Um, this was done in Germany. And um, the we're seeing the data here that um, on the, this is the proportion of total barley area percent. Um, and this is the year. Oh, I see. Oh, this is really interesting. Okay. So in 1983, in year one, we had monoculture. And there's our mold, our mildew, uh, that, that, um, that thing that attacks barley plants in monoculture. And we're seeing there the average infection rate, which is about 50% of the plants in the monoculture were affected by this mildew because the plants are stressed. The plants are competing against each other. We've got the monoculture. In 1983, they introduced some mixed, these populations of um, different uh, barley plants mixed together. And in that first year, 83 to 84, look, it was only a small percentage of the land was now used as populations, but the amount of mildew started to go down really rapidly. That's telling us something really important. Um, this blue line is showing the amount of land that was used with to put to fungicides, was they put pesticides on it to control this mildew. And look, that's going up. So there's an element here of um, the mildew is going down because we've got populations, but we're also now using a fungicide. So we, we need to co correlate that. <clears throat> In 1985, <clears throat> Suddenly, 40% of the land was now mixed populations. We went from 20% in, in 84 to 40% in 85. And we, <clears throat> they also used a little bit more fungicide. You can see the blue line go up. And we see that now the mildew is, co is completely under control. And now as we move to 50, 60%, so we moved towards up to about 90 by 1980, 1990. So this is only a seven year period. We've moved from real monoculture to mixed populations of, of, of our plants. And suddenly our mildew is like gone. We've controlled it. That what was a really a, a aggressive, expensive disease to control. And we've brought it right down. And not only that is, We've also dropped right off our use of fungicides. So only still a small, small area, 20% only where they're doing any spraying at all, and the problem's gone away. That's over 350,000 hectares. That's a significant data, once again, that's telling you our mixed populations do better. Okay, this is where I got a little bit confused, but I could see that. Look, here's a bunch of different varieties of wheat. There's our Heriwood. We, we've already seen that one. Uh, what else did we have? Um, well, whatever. What did we have? Uh, sorry. Maybe it isn't Malacca in Heriwood, was it? No. Shamrock. Okay, we've got some different varieties here. We take this variety and we cross it with this variety and it creates another different, slightly different wheat. And then we take this one, we cross it with that one, and that gives us another one. <clears throat> so by having some different varieties and then crossing those varieties all with each other, so this one this represents one set of genes, one set of genes, but by crossing them all together, we've now created a population where there's an enormous amount of variety, variation between, because this one is, this, this one is Deben crossed with 
Oh, it doesn't work like that. Okay, all right, anyway. I need to understand this more deeply. But clearly what we're seeing is by doing open pollination and cross-pollination, we're creating many more variants. We're creating much more diversity. Um, and the... Okay, here, this is telling us uh, uh, various qualities of the plant. So the original plant, let's say the Harrywood variety, um, it gives us it gives us a certain pattern of availability of, of, of the key nutrients. And we're seeing that when they're mixed together, like we saw the three varieties growing together, is it does better in certain areas. We're starting to get improvements. And then when we do a mixed population where they've all crossed, we get even more benefits. Um, and we're seeing the yield is slightly improving, but also is other things like protein, or I don't know what these other things are telling us, but clearly there is a benefit here. Stability over time, it seems like the, I'm not quite sure what to take from this actually, but it, it, clearly something's going on here. Um, in this one, we've got a field of beans, but we've added, sorry, a field of wheat, but we've added beans. In this one, we've got a field of beans and we've added wheat. How do these things correlate? Um, what's the, um, what are the different outcomes? Look, I'm not, I say, I can't pretend I understand all of these graphs quite. I didn't do this research. But what we're saying is observe and interact. Try out different values, different things. See what happens. Because it's so, with, we, we, what we're seeing is from these patterns is that there's an enormous benefit to be had in embracing diversity. And we're backing this up with hard research and hard numbers. And, um, Here, Professor Wolf is showing us again is, look, here's his crop and he's interplanted it with, with clover or a mix of clovers. So the clover is a plant we're growing for the soil and this here is the plant we're growing for our crop. And look, we've got a tractor with special devices on the back. We're see, seeing examples of integrating diversity into pasture integrating diversity into into in, in, into crops um, the use of different cover crops like clovers and vetches the green manure plants that we can grow alongside our vegetables he's showing the simple tools that he's using you know we can when we work with hand tools we we, we have a great diversity of, of opportunities we can you know we can cultivate the land how we want or we can modify if we have access to machinery we can make small modifications to to suit the type of farming that we want to do so look at this interesting how it's depositing looks like compost but just to, in part of the field to support particular target crop so agroforestry so far, we've had lessons. We've, we've, we've been told how good trees are. We've been told how good it is to create populations of plants with a wide genetics because you get a more stable yield and they're more resistant to pest attack. So we're learning a lot here. Agroforestry, the definition, is the integration of trees, arable and livestock, including fish, into farming systems. Agroforestry is our journey out of monoculture, integrating things together. And we've seen examples of this now. Uh, advantages of tree integration. It achieves ecosystem intimacy. So think about bringing together different systems and, and encourage them to interact. And remember, the more interactions there are, the more stable the system is. Think about the lessons that he's told us so far. 
tr advantage treatment carbon capture and storage. Uh, ammonia abatement. So that's part of your question, uh, Gerard, is, is that's soaking up the, uh, the nitrates that's coming from industrial farming. Trees help with nutrient cycling. Trees help obviously produce food, fuel, fiber. They house biodiversity. Crop and animal protection. We talk about wind protection, reducing the spread of diseases and funguses, and they help with nutrition. Trees also protect soil, water, and air. And there's employment opportunities. You can even look at soil uh, trees as a pension scheme. You can grow, plant your timber crops and long-term yields that are gonna come in 30, 40 years time, maybe. All you need is the inputs, all you need is soil, sun, air, water, and a little bit of labor. Because once you planted that tree, maybe mulched it, maybe just got it started, it's a way. There's so much less work than your annual than your annual crops are, clearly. So here's us, here's him now helping us understand what we're looking at. This part of the farm is mixed hardwood and fruit trees. So we're growing trees because they contribute to the system, long-term fertility, all those other benefits. But this is a long-term yield. I'm going to fell those trees and sell them for timber. I'm obviously going to replace them and grow the next, think about the succession to the next generation. But it gives us a long-term yield. Uh, and we can mix in fruit trees. And those fruit trees are going to give us, obviously, a fruit yield. So this part of the farm, we've got a, a, a tree system that serves one kind of function, one kind of yield. Um, over here, we've got hazel coppice. Now, I think we've talked about ha coppicing. Um, when you cut a, a, a certain trees off at ground level and then they grow back with many stems and they grow back very quickly. And hazel is a uh, very good wood to work with for construction, for tools and tool handles, and for gates and fences and, and, and for hedging and, and, and animal enclosures. So you can translate that into Ugandan, can't you? What would be the equivalent tree in your climate area? What would be the equivalent tree in your uh, soils or the, you know, but that can fulfill this function? Over here, we've got willow. A willow is also another very fast growing tree and we use it as a biomass yield. Uh, we can do simple construction with it, we can make biochar out of it, we can feed to animals, there's all sorts of things we can do. And also willow, because it's so fast growing. Willow is the fastest growing tree in a temperate climate. So what's the equivalent in your tree? Something like Lucina or I don't know, you know, uh, Caliandro, the ones we've talked about. Uh, so this would help uh, mop up ammonia, mop up nitrates, and also give us you know, other different kinds of yields. So we've got, we're growing different trees for different reasons at different areas of the farm. So that's going to create different types of conditions, different habitat opportunities. Agroforestry, uh, wait a minute. So, we see now from my the tour slides, you can see there, look, there's that's willow coppice. I recognize that. And uh, this is, must be, I think, the hazel. But there, look, so we're seeing these avenue fields. There's potatoes. That's a grass. That's maybe a fodder. This is um, whatever has been cultivated for, for vegetables. Look at the patterning. Look how there's never a big expanse of bare soil. And where there is bare soil, it's protected by the hedging around it. Um, you can see, look there, we've got the sun, we can see the shadow or uh, effect there, something or something. And um, strategic arrangement. We've got, and again, it looks like there's one, two, three, four tractor lanes. So you go one or, or whatever it is, however it, however it would be. But it's designed around the tools that they intended to use. And um, also we've and we've also got an ar organic arable rotation and trials. Our products include timber, 
energy, fruit, nuts, craft materials, cereals, vegetable, but soil fertility, pest and disease control, biodiversity. Those monoculture farms aren't getting any of that. They're only producing the wheat. Here we've got so much more going on. And we're building soil and we're raising soil carbon and we're, we're, we're speaking to and interacting with the biodiversity of the region. So in the Wakeland system, we've got a bunch of hardwoods, ash, hornbeam, Italian alder oak, small leaf lime, sycamore, wild cherry, and, and we've also got, I don't know what that quite means, but lots of different, oh, apples and stuff. So, okay, maybe you don't know those trees. Maybe you can't grow those in your climate, but you've got hardwood trees, you've got teak, You've got uh, mahogany, you've got, I don't know what you grow, you've got, you've got msizi, msizi, you've got many different trees. You tell me what's going to work in your situation, but your long-term hardwood yields. What about your fruit and nut trees? Range of top fruit. So would you avocados or your pawpaws or some understory fruit trees like pawpaw uh, or, or other kinds of bushes? The jacker fruit, uh, you tell me, what, what are you going to grow? We've also got nuts, we've got walnuts, we've got plums, whole, so many things. And then we've got our coppice systems. These are the things, the fast growing trees that we grow for biomass. So we've got a mixture of willow varieties and hazel varieties. Okay, that's what we're growing. What are you gonna grow? We're gonna grow plants that have these characteristics and fulfill these functions, but they suit your climate zone and they support your needs and they speak to the markets and the demand for, for, for resources that, that you have in your area. This is what I mean. We design from the patterns to the details. I'm showing you the pattern. You can learn the detail for how to apply these ideas in your home. We're seeing some willow alleys here. These are the uh, uh, really well established uh, alleys of willow. Look, these trees are six, seven, eight meters tall. When we want to, we can just crop the whole lot and it will grow back. Um, and again, creating, look at the wind shelter effect, especially you saw how flat that land is, right? In those early photos, I think I tell you in East Anglia, the wind really whips across there because it's, there's no protection. So within this farm, so much more sheltered. So some willow data. So we've got a, a, a mixture of five types of willow planted as pairs of rows. So that's what we're looking at there. So there's pairs of rows with five types of willow mixed together. Okay. Um, so every two years may have 44 tons of fresh weight per hectare so that if you dry that out and average that out that's 11 tons of dry weight per hectare per year now it's telling us there something about it's boosting overall fertility sorry, productivity by a factor of 1.4. So by doing this, our total yield is one and a half times if we'd only had the monoculture. Um, so here's another, these are the hardwood trees, look in pasture. This is what we call silvo pasture. Uh, silvo meaning trees in pasture, long-term farm systems. And again, what they found was the, the total yield of this system. So if we just had the grass, we haven't got as much grass as if we just had a monoculture. And we haven't got as much trees if we just had a monoculture of trees, the yield. But if you add the value of this yield to that one, it's about one and a half times more than if it was a monoculture. And so we're getting it's more productive by, by, by one and a half times, but it's also giving all of these other ecosystems functions. So just think how important that is. Think what we're learning. 
Um, and you've got 21 varieties of apples in 38 trees, seven timber species, um, all planted in alleys. That's his agroforestry system. He's got, yeah, anyway, come on, you can see it. There it is. Um, what we've noticed is compared to what we've got here. All right, so Clark's Lane Orchard. This is an intense system. He's contrasting the two systems. What he's saying is, um, at the uh, Clark's Lane Orchard, um, the percentage of scab occurrence, so that's a common disease in uh, apples, and it, over 50% of them are suffering to some degree with the scab, and the variance was between 55 and 65. And here we see at Wakelands Agroforestry that it's down to about 22%. It's, it's almost a third of the disease. And large fruits, so this is in early July when they're still small. This is in the end of the August when the fruits are big. And so there's a bit more scab, but it's only a tiny bit more. And, um, uh, but it's up to 80% and the other farm. So we're seeing how diversity gives you resistance to disease. Diversity is giving us greater yields, gives us a greater total yield, and it gives it, and, and, and it requires less inputs. So this is this is kind of staggering. Um, so on his 22 hectares, he reckons he has 45 to 50 species of birds. Um, st anyway, it's just staggering, 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 staggering biodiversity. Uh, so the summary benefits of, of agroforestry, we're getting fruits, nuts, we've got browsing for animals, we get timber, we get energy, carbon sequestration, organic matter, shade, shelter, climate regulation, pest and disease control, pollination, purification of soil, water and air. It supports the nutrient dispersal and cycling, seed dispersal, soil microbial development, and creates lots of habitats. And culturally, it's going to give more employment, longer term yields that might contribute to things like pensions, mental and spiritual health, recreational benefits. And the only inputs are soil, water, sun, and some labor, and obviously we need some seeds. So to make, to make this work, we need, there is a need for a better appreciation of total productivity from and environmental benefits of agroforestry systems. So we need, to, we need to value the whole yield, not just think barley, 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 maize, maize, maize. Understand those other benefits. And we need appropriate regulatory changes to allow farmers to take advantages of agroforestry systems. Governments, whether it's the EU or in East Africa or anywhere, is, we should be incentivizing this. They need to realize this is part of our climate change response, it's part of our food uh, security response, cultural resilience, and also economic diversity. So there we go. There is a beautiful picture of these mixed populations. Look how different they are all these different forms of wheat, all together, we get a bigger yield, we have much less disease, and we have many, many other ecosystems benefits. Okay, so um, let's say thank you to uh, Professor Wolf for that absolutely stunning, uh, if I may say it, output of his life's work. And uh, wouldn't it be nice if we were saying the same of you, of your work? <laughs> but uh, not to make light, but no, tremendously important. Um, yeah, Gerald, uh, uh, any thoughts and would anybody like to um, contribute at this point? Um, just, you know, appreciative is a whole ton of research which is, you know, in the right direction. And uh, as we've already said, the next 
step. You know, we've done the empowerment, we've done the livelihood empowerment and all that resilience. But then as of now, adding the extra bit of research is uh, in the right direction. And uh, well, that's really massive. And uh, not only massive, but empowering to show that no matter the point you're starting, the thing is, let's start. And uh, it's so possible because if he's managed to achieve all that within the temperate climate with uh, lots of uh, seasons, uh, dormant seasons, how about in the tropics where you literally have no dormancy is so year-round growth. Just imagine what can be achieved. Actually, to just give you a rough example, if he did that in, uh, let's say, 30, uh, 35 years, then just be assured that in the tropics, you're able to do it in 10 in 10 years. So let's, the first thing is start slow and small solutions and appreciate humble beginnings. Get started from whichever point you're standing. Over to you, Steve. And is anyone having a comment, a question or any addition? I guess everyone is still overwhelmed. Back to you, Steve. Okay, thank you, Gerald. Uh, I also appreciate your little summaries, uh, uh, really important. And uh, just, uh, yeah, focus on those key points and, 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 and think about, reflect a little bit on what we've seen there. So, yeah, that's 35 years of research. So, just to mirror back what you said, and I did mention it earlier, but when he, he was there, he was, you know, when I was there, he was 85. His wife was very elderly too, and she was very frail. And, 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 and she wanted to say something, but we couldn't hear her because uh, her voice was so quiet. And we all had to really concentrate. And she said, I told him to start it earlier. <laughs> and I said, if the one lesson is, this is so fantastic. Why did we wait? You know, what were we waiting for? And I thought that was something insightful. So yeah, what you just said, Gerald, let's get on it. Except we're starting from humble beginnings. We're not Professor Martin Wolf. I don't know, 35 years ago, maybe he wasn't either, you know? Um, so just think about that. So we've got to begin these things. And, and I think that we've just seen a really, really powerful lesson there. And, and, and I want us just to, to reflect on that. So I'm going to take you on another little field trip. I want you to imagine that you're here with me and you're going to put your wellies on you're going to put your coat on i'm going to take you outside we're going to go to north wales and we're going to go and look at the bfg this is the bangor forest garden uh bangor is a, a very ancient um town in north wales and well you know the places and um and there's a very important university there and at that university they also have research into agroforestry. Uh, they're interested in a lot in uh, the a, a really powerful forestry course and a, a bunch of other things as well. Some of the students at, at Bangor University a few years ago now, I'm not sure how long, let's say 20 years, I'm not sure, um, started a forest garden, like a food forest. And it's now really quite mature. And I'm going to show you around it. And again is, I know it's a temperate system. It's going to look different in your place. But if we can do this here, what can you do there? there? There's your challenge. Think about how we might bring together many, many different productive species. Think about in a forest garden, we're really interested in the perennials. We're not going to be growing wheat or barley or maize in alleys in between or potatoes or the things we just saw. We're really interested in those tree crops, 
um, that, those long-term perennial plants. So let's just enjoy, imagine having a walk, it's a lovely day with a group of students. And these pictures are taken on exactly those circumstances. I was with a group of students and we were, you know, walking around the garden and chit-chatting about what we've been learning and seeing with our eyes an example of, you know, what's possible. So uh, I'm going to take you to Bangor. So here we are. We're at the BFG, Bangor Forest Garden. Lovely. How do I do this? Here's the map of it. So we always want to start with some kind of a map or a plan. And I don't know whether the garden came first and the map came after or whether they planned it. But there's certain elements here. They've got a pond, but we've got interesting paths. We've got a herb spiral. We've got some raised beds. There's a yurt. That's a sort of a temporary structure. We've got Italian alder, holly, hazel, sweet chestnut, lime. Those would be big overstory trees. I would guess that those trees were there already. And that what they've done is they filled in with slightly more uh, exotic or, or less common plants. Uh, myrtle, Eliagnus, we've got a crab pear, a digger pie, a hazel, a medlar, a walnut. Um, you know, I'm challenging you. Just meeting you, Caroline. We get a bit of bit of bit of, bit of travel noise from you. Um, so we're looking at this system, and we can. What we're trying to understand is that probably some of these elements would have existed already, and then they've come in with a plan. They've worked out where the piles are going to go, and then they've started to add other kinds of trees that maybe fit together in a complex three-dimensional pattern. So there's our map of the BFG. There's a sense of what it might look like from, from above. Oh, there's another nice picture of it, look. You see, and just think, diversity, diversity, diversity. That's what we're all about. Use and value diversity. So look at all these different kinds of trees, different edges, different light, different heights. Think about the different soil microbes. Think about the different birds. Think about the different interactions. Think about everything that Professor Wolf has just taught us, and now we're applying it to a different pattern, a different system. Okay. This is actually a monkey puzzle tree. This has edible nuts. There it is growing. This comes from South America. It's an exotic. It's not from here. Um, but think about how a garden like this might then start to serve as like a species library. We could propagate from this. We could collect the seeds. We could, you know, just learn on how to grow it. Um, so there's a nice little uh, explanation of what is a forest garden. And one of the things that we always talk about in forest gardens is it's three dimensional. Here's a big canopy tree. Uh, there's a fruiting tree, a bit smaller. Understory trees and shrubs, herbaceous plants flowers, herbs, you know, stacked together in a three-dimensional shape. Look, they've got a, a website, uh, I don't know if it's still active, but thebfg.org.uk. Think about how you're going to share your knowledge, share your, um, your learning, catch and store energy, develop yields. So it says, the main purpose of the garden is to produce fresh food, such as leaves, fruits, seeds and nuts, roots, flowers, fungi, honey, medicinal plants, dyes, fibres, wood products, oils, mulching materials. There's your diversity of yields. So we've got some edible wild plants. What would be the equivalent where you are? Things that happily grow and propagate themselves, that we could let go wild in the garden. We've got some examples here, but these are temperate plants. You'll have similar ones. So again, think, look at the layering, look at the different conditions. Herbaceous plants, grasses, 
shrubs, small trees. Here's one of our students. We've got a fenced area, interesting edge area here. There's the yurt, that's a structure, got a space for people to go. And perhaps if it's raining, we can go in there and eat our sandwiches or, or, or chat about what we're learning. Creating a habitat for people as well. Nice path walking towards it, got nettles. Um, these are wild plants in the UK, they're very useful, very good for insects. And seeing look, the variation between herbs, bigger shrubs, small trees, layered systems. Remember, this is a garden. This has been planned and planted. Looks like a wild space. How would we manage it? What, what kinds of techniques would we use to, to, to optimize it? Um, what tools might we need? These are all perhaps things we might want to think about. Um, lemon balm, this is a lovely scented herb that, that will grow wild and spread. That looks like a big apple tree, seeing fruits on it. Is that, is, oh, what is it? Oh, maybe that, what are they? Oh, it's the head, no, that's, um, it's a chestnut. That's a chestnut tree, they've got a nut tree. There's, there's a very, very good, that's a very good yield on that. I think I'm right. Again, pathways, ways to go through the garden and explore. Um, here we've got, because we've got people to learn from, we're, we're, we're naming things and telling people what to look out for. Look at all these different varieties of plants, all joined together as if it was a wild system, but it isn't, it's planted. Got a nice little place to sit and, uh, and meet and chat and making some tea on a fire probably. And there's, there's our host who's chatting us about, um, about the place. Meet our students. Having a nice time. More diversity, more layers of productivity, fruits. Um, some areas of these, uh, these would be soft fruits and berries, um, propagation areas. Some of it looks a bit overgrown, but that's fine. Uh, look where it's been grafting, bringing, creating new varieties or joining, creating uh, more diversity. Some more managed areas, again, look like soft fruits. Looks like a lot of people are eating as they're walking along, enjoying the fruits of the garden. So now they look heavily fruiting. I identify what this is. Are these? I'm not quite sure. Whatever it is, there's a lot of them. There's someone else. I do know that one. I can't think of its name. But, um, diversity, productivity, all joined together, stacked together in a system that needs almost no maintenance. Once it's established, it just keeps growing. Look, everybody's just eating, eating, enjoying the product, the produce. Apples and berries and shrubs and herbs all sitting together. It's beautiful. Um, I think I'm seeing lots of caterpillars there eating, I believe. This is a ginkgo tree. It's a very ancient form of tree. Um, and here we are again in a propagation area. You can see that the, Maybe they're taking cuttings and seeds and, uh, and, and, and promoting, making more plants. Once you started off, we've now got the material to extend the garden, to keep making more plants. Maybe we could sell some for income, swap them with neighbors to maybe get more diversity. As soon as we reach a position of surplus, we, we've suddenly we've got endless more opportunities to extend the system. And, and develop more yields and, and you just keep adding to it, keep learning, allowing it to grow. And um, again, there's our 
just explanation, drawing people into the thinking, help people understand what you're doing, help them interpret what you're going on. So it says, we are a voluntary group creating a demonstration forest garden at the University of Wales Research Centre, Henweis, near Abba Gwyn Gregin. We get together regularly to do gardening and develop the site, making friends, learning new skills. Invite people in. Come and take part. Come and find out what we're doing. Here's an explanation. Here's an invite. This is how we build and grow. Um, okay, final few slides. Here's, this is a different garden. This is one that I was involved in developing. Uh, this is on a roof in Reading. This is the Reading International Solidarity R Risk Roof Garden at 39 London Street, Reading. And Sector 39 was born in this garden. The idea came to me and I wanted to spread the knowledge and the inspiration of 30, 39 London Street to everyone else. And so Sector 39 is, the, is my creation to disperse that knowledge. So this is our, look, fruit garden, trees, productivities, medicinal plants, uh, 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 culinary plants growing together in a guild, complex system on a rooftop, using the, the structure of the roof that we've grown grapes along the, the fence, um, creating, the, this, is, this is the stairway to get onto the roof garden. And I made it into like a tunnel of plants so that you felt like you were coming into a, you know, you get a real sense of entering a woodland. Um, this is a Chinese Sichuan pepper tree, um, another variety of yields. There's so much diversity out there once you look. This is a, 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 a crab apple, wild apple species. These are kiwi fruits, uh, again, growing on climbers, growing on railings, on roofs. Um, the path going through it, access for people. Seating areas, compost areas. Look, we're on a roof. We're surrounded by a desert in the same way as uh, as Wakeland's farm was surrounded by an agricultural desert. Here we're surrounded by an urban desert. And I tell you, all the birds head towards this garden. There's 170 species of plants in this garden, and they all have multiple uses, and they're all growing together as if it was a single system. And our challenge and our delight was to keep to seeing how can we add more species? How can we add more elements? How can we keep diversifying this system? There's uh, black bamboo there. No? Uh, bamboo is such an important plant. Um, there's different kinds of fruits. Um, and this was just must have been just late summer when the garden was just peaking. But we created different areas within the garden so that we could, again, explore diversity, have space where the light comes in and have space where it's more dense. Create, exploring diversity, exploring three dimensions and exploring the diversity of yields. So this garden is really small. It's only 70 metres long and eight metres wide. And yet we've managed to fit in all of these different plants, and you can get lost in it, even in such a small space. Fruits everywhere. Look at the natural mulch forming on the ground, protecting that soil. You, you forget where you are when you're on it. You, you, you think you could be, you know, lost in the jungle. But this is, yeah, rooftop and ready. And there's again, I'm always trying to use these, create these models to inspire people, to inform people. We can do better. We can, we can add diversity. And look, there's looking at the building from outside. It looks so inviting, so interesting, and so different from everything else around it. Um, so that's one of the things, again, I'm immensely proud of having had a small hand in uh, contributing to, to this project. And there we go. Well, it's different, different spaces within it. Old varieties of maize traditional varieties, lemons, even growing in a glass house. Um, 
It's an arbutus tree. Anyway, I think we've seen this enough. But again, it's, uh, uh, that's a kiwi climbing up a tree. Wow, I've forgotten how amazing this garden is, actually. Gosh. There we go. I'm going to stop there. Using value diversity. Think about all of the things that we've, we've touched on. And um, we've lost a few people, I'm afraid, sadly. Um, I know uh, Andre's phone doesn't stay charged for very long. But uh, anyway, we have recorded and we will be posting. So there we go. Um, Gerald, I'm kind of running out of work. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause here and uh, let's have some summary thoughts and, and, and any questions or feedback from, from, from who it remains. Yeah, sure. And uh, that last bit was also really, really essential to further, you know, inform the group that uh, it's not about the acres, it's not about the, you know, the massive resources. So even from your backyard, you can still make the necessary steps or you can start right in your backyard. So access or start from where you stand is, uh, as Steve said at the start, uh, with permaculture, yes, we'll show you the different contexts, but then remember, it's the patterns. Yeah, they are universally applicable. So the only difference is uh, it will remain the same, you know, basic idea. So it will just call for your application or how best do you fit it to your relevant situation, to your current situation. So thanks, Steve, for the last section also. It, I found it really interesting. And maybe you forgot to mention the apple tree at the front of your uh, at just at the front of your house, which is really, really also interesting. Just uh, a small garden, but uh, there are two apple trees, but very productive. And then uh, here we also do, there are what we call uh, the community, sort of, the, we would call them community gardens but they are usually small. But when you look at uh, those that are well-managed and uh, you know, with permaculture principles, you will find them abundantly uh, you know, uh, productive. So it's not about the size, it's not about uh, the resources, however little you have, however little steps you have, the thing is take the first step utilize value, diversity, and all the, the principles that we've discussed from, from our first session. It's interesting to note that this is our 19th session. So it should be interesting to get to hear your feedback and uh, to keep the platform engaged with uh, all the feedback. Thank you. And uh, unless we have any other feedback from Carol, Nicholas, or Peter. <laughs> uh, thank you so much okay, for the lesson. Um, it's, it's very essential because we are in the process of planning, you know, we are in the process of planning the the the, the 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 demo farm, you know? So we are planning the food forest. You know, we have to think through the stratification, what to play. So this is very, very good for me. And uh, probably in the WhatsApp chat, um, should I get stuck along the way? I, I, I will always consult. So I'm sure the whole class can come up with something very good. Thank you. Thanks, Caroline. And yes, we are 
always open to support you. We are here to support and the whole team actually, because we are also encouraging peer to peer uh, support. So we are here to support. And it will be interesting also to look at, at that as a product of the course, if you can have it as uh, your project, as the output of this course, it will be really interesting to get to, to see the output. Yes, Mr. Simon, over to you. Yes. I really, I really need to appreciate for the research that has been done by principal. It really gives us some impressive aspect of coping up the diversity of that research. Really, it looks so nice. And uh, I put this as a challenge to us, the permaculture class, that uh, whatsoever little resources that we have, let us try to put them into practice so that we make the diversity uh, and the sustainability of that research that has been done by our principal. Really, it, it, it sounds that he wants to impact us with the knowledge, with the skills, with all systems of, 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 of Western countries to Africa and East Africa at large so that we try to make our lives and our environment change. Uh, again, I, I would want to appreciate on the WhatsApp account that has been just created by, 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 by the principal there. So members, let us exchange the views and the ideas and knowledge to each other such that we should not leave one or the other behind. Uh, 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 and then uh, the aspect of diversity, members, let us not worry about how we can diversify, but look at your backyard, look at the little Oh, Simon, uh, you've muted. You've muted, unfortunately. It could be network which is kicking over and bringing me back. It keeps on disturbing me, network. Okay. Uh, so we can hear you now. Yes, the little that we have, please let us put them into practice. System integration, system incorporation, and we see how we maintain permaculture to all our communities. And uh, as he talked of feedbacks, yes, it, it is really very brilliant that once information has been given back to uh, from a recipient to a receiver, then definitely communication has been completed. But when one side has not received uh, any communication from the angle of his components, and then that means there is something that might have been, that, that might be wrong at that time, such that there could be some delays in that. Uh, so as rains are in, uh, we believe that the diversity that we have seen from from the wolves or from Martin's farm, really, it, it, it brings a picture that if at one moment my farm also looks like that, how will it be? Huh? It will be something very impressive and uh, gives you knowledge that I really learned some something from sector 39, huh? which would be good. Cool. So members, let us bring the, 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 the aspects of all sessions that we have gone in through into practice. And I, will, uh, I welcome all knowledge, all ideas, all the, all the skills 
to Tapa and Apad at large, such that we try to change the traditional aspect of farming that people have in Eastern region and, and, and East Africa and Africa at large. That's why you see the production of, 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 of our farmers mostly is lower. It is simply because they don't want to change their traditional aspect of farming into the diversified type of farming. And then the need that we get due to their traditional type of farming is low. But if one would, would have engaged himself into the diversified type of farming where he uses the, the, the machines for cultivation, harvesting, preservation, and so forth and so forth, they are, I believe that results of the, of the farming would be higher than the traditional aspect that we are practicing each and every time, year after year, and we are not changing our, 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 our standards of living due to that practice. Uh, so it is really something challenging to us, and we don't know how we can cope up with it, but in the meantime, slowly, slowly, as you say, it will make us also catch up with those modern types of farming and then diversity, it is relevant sustainability and good yield would be at a higher production. Oh, thanks so much, Simon. And uh, to further re-emphasize, one of the key aspects of diversity, other than, you know, creating stronger systems, actually now this is heading to resilience. Throughout our programming, as we go ahead now, as we do empowerment and everything, let's also emphasize resilience because the reality is, yes, we are faced with all the absurdities that have been created, the hazards and you know the negative feedbacks. And the only way out of that is creating resilient systems. How do we create that is through diversity or diversifying. This can range from both the physical elements and the non-physical. So if you don't have the physical, how about looking at diversity from the non-physical aspects? It could be in terms of skills, talents, and all the other aspects. Uh, Caroline, is that a new hand before we hand back to Steve? Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so for me, when uh, you talk about diversity, especially in, uh, when you talk about diversity, especially in our farming system, for me, what comes to mind is nutrition and food security because diversity gives us this resilience. Because you find that at any one time, somebody will walk into their farm and come out with something. You see, uh, I, I, for me, that is the heart uh, of the matter, you know? And I'm so passionate about it because it helps the mamas put food on their tables for their family. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Caroline. That's a beautiful way to sum it up. Over to you, Steve. Brilliant. Thank you for your comments as well, uh, Nicholas. And I, I'm glad that you're finding this um, content useful and inspiring and informative. And um, I kind of surprise myself each week. Is I, I honestly I learn so much myself and. Um, I, I hope you found that interesting, you know, uh, uh, visiting the work there of, of Martin Wolf, because clearly, um, you know, it's still dawning on me that the significance and the relevance of what he's done. And not only has he created that demonstration farm so we can see it, 
but he's done the research. He's captured that information and he's, he's found ways to communicate that to inspire other people. And think about that as his legacy. He's, he has passed on now, but he has left that farm. And he's communicated that knowledge through people like me and many other people so that I can share it with you. And then think about how that same process replicates. And, and in terms of embracing diversity, let's think about the diversity of people that we are and what we represent through the connections that we have in our own communities. And, and think about how that information, that knowledge, that, that energy can flow out and inspire and you know carry on being part of the healing of our planet and the healing of our people and the healing of ourselves by really learning from nature and from learning from the pioneers you know there's pioneer people around us who, who have who have shown us a way and i'm only i'm inspired by people like martin wolf and i you know i'm only passing on that and contributing in a small way and that's what we all can do so let's 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 use that as our closing thought a little bit over time and i thank everybody for your participation this week i, I think we've had another really good session and let's keep thinking uh, gerald's going to start working on our whatsapp group let's start telling our stories this is where peer-to-peer -peer learning kicks in this is what our academy is about is we all going to learn from each other i'm showing you the patterns but you guys are finding the details of your situation so when I showed you the BFG, the Bangor Forest Garden or, or the Risk Garden, that, that was us doing the detail in our locality in something that speaks to other people or in, around us. So your challenge is to find the same detail for your situation. It won't be the same, but it'll be informed by the same ideas and the same principles. Okay, thank you very much everybody. And I will, we will reconnect again next week for uh, session 20 and uh, on the journey goes. Thanks, Steve. Good night, everyone. Bye bye. Night, Good everyone. night. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. 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 Yeah.